Um, this is the build sales profitably and compliantly with third party marketers breakout session. So hopefully that's where you all want to be. Um, if not, you can quickly escape. I think we're starting a couple minutes late, but we have, I think, probably around 60 to 70 minutes at this point um, from now until the you know, about 4.30 end time. Um, so here's our, our agenda. I'll try and keep the introductions pretty quick, um, and then we'll have 15 minutes each for our panelists, and then we'll try and leave a lot of time for Q&A um, at the end. So hopefully that works. Um, for everyone. Um, I've tried to structure the order of the panelists in a way that would, that would make sense. Um, we'll have Kristen Tackle from Strike and Tackle kind of set the, the scenery uh, from a legal landscape. Um, and then we'll move into David Studdart with Wine Country Connect um, to talk about the opportunities um, when viewing this from the marketer point of view. Um, and then we'll move to Jeff Stey from Twisted Oak Winery, and he'll give us the winery perspective on his experiences uh, working with marketers. Uh, and then I'll give you um, a quick overview of how Ship Compliant Marketplace kind of fits into the picture. So that's about that. Um, so we're going to kind of switch off on, on uh, presentations here, um, but we'll get started with... Kristen, um, she is very experienced in navigating the legal waters of new business models in marketing wine. So we're lucky to have her with us to share some insights. Um, so I'm going to switch over her presentation and get her started. everyone, I'm Kristen. I'm glad to see you're still awake and getting close to wine. Um, but so I think it's been a pretty big theme of to the day that the opportunities for marketing your wine are expanding and they're changing and they're expanding and changing at a pace that is exceeding the regulations that control you as a winery. So it's a huge opportunity for you to get to know what is available right now in terms of marketing your wine and to see if you can come up with a path to market your product, which is much more regulated than a typical product, through these new marketing opportunities. So if everybody has been to some of the earlier sessions, you pretty much know by now that a third party provider is a, in general, unlicensed entity that's involved in marketing your product. And unlike a typical marketing relationship where maybe you paid a flat fee to get an advertisement in a newspaper and hoped that someone that you wanted to reach read that newspaper and hoped that they saw your ad and hoped that the ad really inspired them to go buy your product and then you had no idea if anyone who bought your product actually bought it because of seeing that ad. What the new marketers are able to do is to deliver a consumer that is completely predisposed to purchase your product to you and to track them all the way through to completion. And they don't want to be paid a flat fee for doing that. In general, they want to be paid based on the result that they're uniquely able to deliver to you. So this is a challenge for wineries, and it's not impossible. I'm here to tell you, don't be discouraged. You just need to be educated about how these models work and the questions that you need to ask in order to make sure you're working with vendors that are going to leave you compliant as a winery. So again, alcoholic beverage businesses have been late to adopt these marketing principles and or marketing opportunities. And primarily it's because you're not selling shoes, right? Unlike a shoe provider who doesn't need a license to sell their product and can sell to someone of any age and can market with all sorts of claims, you simply can't. And the people that you hire to market for you are also restricted by the same restrictions that apply to you. The big question is how can you start using these channels without stopping in your tracks because of all of the complicated legal compliance issues that you've got to deal with. The California ABC has taken a huge leadership role in helping you as wineries figure out how you can compliantly use these providers. And they did that by getting a group together about a little over a year ago, a group of interested industry people to discuss the big picture issues that the ABC has in California and really in every state with the use of unlicensed entities to help you market your wine product. And this is the big gigantic question in California and really in every other state. 
At what point is the activity of this unlicensed party so intrinsically tied to the sale of alcohol that they're making a sale without a license? A somewhat related point, at what point are they doing something that is a solicitation that equates to sale? This is a lesser issue to be focused on as you explore these opportunities, but a few states do have laws that equate the word solicitation to sale, and we're working with those states on broadening their definition of solicitation. The converse of the question is, at what point is this unlicensed person completely taking over your license? You all know that as a licensee, it's your job to operate your license. So the ABC got together with this group of industry players. Ship Compliant was there. A whole bunch of attorneys from the industry were there. Wholesalers were there. And the ABC regulators were there. And the end result, which was referenced earlier, is this third party advisory that came out last October. This is available on the California ABC website. And this is the first and the only existing guidance on how you can, as an alcoholic beverage licensee, compliantly use a third party marketer. No other state has put out guidance like this yet. I would encourage all of you to read it immediately if you have not. And you can email anyone at Ship Compliant and get a copy, or you can email me and get a copy, or you can just go to the internet and get a copy from the ABC website. So the, uh, the big issues that this advisory came out, it's really a four-page document, and it was based on where's that line drawn? And the ABC came up with a holistic test, and they said there isn't one place where a line is drawn. We look at a whole bunch of factors in deciding whether or not the way someone is marketing something crosses a line into doing something only a licensee can do. And these are the factors uh, in somewhat of a scrambled order that the ABC in California identified as things that are indic indicative of a license activity. So there's three really big concepts here. The first one, which is actually covered really in number one, number two, number four, and number six, is the idea of control. The licensee has got to be making the sale. That control can be evidenced in a lot of ways. It can be evidenced by your direct shipping records actually showing it was your license that the sale was made under. It can be shown by control to some extent over the product selection that's featured, the pricing of the products that's featured, um, your ability to reject or accept an order for whatever reason it is in your own compliance needs that you want to accept or reject an order, uh, and your control of the overall funds that you receive. This was a very controversial piece of the process with the ABC. They originally said uh, you've got to have, when you're a third-party marketer, an account that is for every single winery that you service, and the funds need to flow directly to that account. So if you were a third-party marketer, you'd open up you know, 700 bank accounts. And it, 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 that's not what is, they came off of that in the discussions. And the rule now is that the winery needs to have ultimate control of funds. Those funds need to settle to a place where they ultimately belong to the winery, and the winery dictates how everybody else gets paid. So as a lot of these third-party marketers do want to be paid, you dictate that often as part of your contract with them, and you get to say, this is what you're going to get paid. It's a negotiation, though, so it doesn't always go that smoothly. So order uh, or control is the huge thing, and that's the number one thing when you are talking to a third-party marketer that you're considering using that you should think about. You know what you need to control, and do you retain enough control over what's happening? Are you part of the process with the third-party marketer? The second factor up here, which is I think number three, is compliance with the laws applicable to a licensee. There are a lot of third party marketers out there that shall sell shoes. That's hard to say. That sell shoes. And they sell shoes very well because they can match a consumer to the shoes that they want. And they can match that to a 13 year old consumer or an 18 year old consumer. Or they can offer free goods in connection with those shoes. You can't do any of those things. So you need to be careful when you're working with a third party marketer that you work with someone who has worked with alcohol before. And if they haven't, they need to be educated about what it means to market and advertise alcohol. You need to be educated about where your product's going through these people. And you need to be educated about the marketing restrictions in the states that it's going to. Uh, an interesting point from Steve Gross's earlier presentation was that there's a few states that require, for example, your license number to be on communication. It's a small rule, Connecticut and Michigan, but it's something that you should, or Washington, excuse me, Connecticut and Washington, but it's something you should know about and that you should make sure the compliance is there. You don't need an extra headache from using these marketers and they're ready to service you and make the changes that they need to make. And the final and I think most controversial factor that the ABC wanted to talk about was payment for service. So when the conversation started with the ABC, they were at a point where they wanted all third-party marketers to be paid the same way you pay for a newspaper ad. Here is a flat fee. Maybe this will work. Maybe it won't. 
either way, I pay you this amount. That doesn't work with modern marketing. That's not the way any modern marketer wants to be paid. So the ABC moved off of that and instead has gone with a reasonableness standard. So you can pay a flat fee, you can pay a staggered fee, you can even pay a percentage fee as long as it's reasonable. Reasonable is not defined. So reasonable could be a percentage. In conversations with the counsel to the ABC, I've been told that they will never say 10% is always okay. They will never say 30% is always not okay. It's always looking at the totality of the circumstances. Is the service that they're providing to you, is that a fair price for it? Um, I, I tell clients as a general matter, if you talk to a third party marketer who wants 90% of the sale price, that's probably a dangerous thing to do. If you talk to someone who's able to connect you to a unique consumer that there's no way that you could reach otherwise, and they want 20% of the sale price for that, that's probably pretty reasonable. So it's, there aren't any regulations on this yet. There's actually no enforcement guidance. It's completely a judgment call, which is why you need to get to know your service providers. So as I mentioned earlier, California is the only state that's come out and actually given guidance. That's why you need to review their industry advisory and become comfortable with it. We have talked to a lot of other states as they're just really starting to understand that this model exists and think about it. And it's these factors over and over again. Each state focuses slightly on one thing or another as the issue that they're struggling with. None of them have formalized rules yet. And all of them are concerned with where this line is that becomes a sale without a license or becomes you making your license completely rented out to another person. Um, just some helpful information on some big states you probably care about and where their heads are at on the issue. Uh, in New York, they've got a law, they call it availing, that's the common term there, and it basically says you can't make your license available to someone else. They have not commented on the specific marketing agent model for wine sales, but it did come up last fall in the context of daily discount sites for general coupons, and the SLA put out two declaratory rulings where they just touched on the issue of licensee control and fair payment that's consistent with what you would normally pay an advertiser for the service that they're able to provide to you. Uh, where the SLA was very concerned was when they felt that the companies that were licensed in the state of New York were ceding too much control to third-party marketers. So keep in mind control, make sure your marketers are doing things that are compliant with the law and make sure you're paying them fair. I should note, um, these are interesting and available on the SLA website in terms of being compliant with the law. The issue the New York SLA had was that retailers were discounting too deeply. New York has got a rule about restaurants and bars discounting the price of alcohol below 50%, and some of these deals were resulting in a retail discount below 50%. So that was what brought it to the, the attention of the SLA, not so much the marketing agent model itself, but the fact that someone is out there doing something for a retailer that they're not allowed to do themselves. And that's why you gotta make sure you work with somebody who knows the business. Uh, Texas, again, hasn't said anything formally. The factors they're most focused on are payment processing and wanting to make sure that the payment is processed in a way that it accrues to the licensee. This is another great thing the ship compliance system does, so you don't have to worry about it. And also compensation. They won't say a percentage is always wrong, but they're uncomfortable with it generally and prefer flat fees whenever possible. A 90% commission would be a problem to a regulator in Texas and would be the kind of model that they'd likely enforce against. In Illinois, they think about a lot of factors. Um, I think this one's an interesting one because you see the same things repeated, control, especially funds, how much compensation are you paying, how does the money flow, but then they threw in who owns the website on which the sale is made, which I think uh, is not an indicia of who's actually controlling the sale in many, many, many situations, but this just gives you a sense of the fact that regulators are still wrapping their head around this, just like you guys are. Um, that's why they don't have formal policies yet and you should be wrapping your head around each of these opportunities you have, just trying to look holistically at what is this person able to do for me and do I retain control over my sales? So again, these are the, the six factors that they looked at in California. These are the six factors that I think as this expands and more states take positions, they're gonna be taking positions on. And in the vacuum right now, what you guys should be doing is reading the California advisory you should be paying attention to what's happening in this area. SHIP compliant stays on top of the issues, so if you're already working with them, you should make sure you pay attention to any updates in terms of what states say, and you should be really looking at the opportunities that you've got and looking at the websites. If someone wants to market for you, 
look at what they do. Is there anything on their website that you know you're not allowed to do? Are they shipping to Utah? Do they want you to ship to Utah? You can't do that. You probably shouldn't use them if they're encouraging people to ship to Utah. No one's encouraged people to, right? I don't want to bag on anyone who's managed to figure that out, but I don't think anyone has. Um, and look for reasonableness and look for their ability to work with the restrictions that you know are applicable to you on a functional level. Do they have integration that's going to help you manage your capacity caps and the million details that you need to manage as a winery? If they're using SHIP compliant, that's a good sign. If they're not, can they answer your questions about how they're going to manage your compliance needs? So those are just a few things to think about. Uh, I don't want to scare anyone too much. It really is a little bit of the Wild West right now, but companies like Ship Compliant are doing great things so that you can comfortably use these marketers and comply with the California ABC advisory. And I think that the thing that you can do is keep your mind open. This is a huge channel. I, I know I have a lot of clients who are getting massive amounts of sales from this, and it's an opportunity that can be completed legally if you just take the time to be careful and selective about who you work with. One final thought, talk to your business people and your teams as a whole before you do any steep discounting on sites. Um, I definitely have seen some issues where the use of various marketing agents might not be consistent with what others in the group have perceived in terms of brand strategy. So just be thoughtful that just because someone looks legally compliant, you still want to talk to the business team to make sure they're the right ones to work with. Do a little transition here. Um, next, we have David Stutter with Wine Country Connect. And I think I mentioned earlier, um, he has the experience from the marketer side. And I think that he has a real good sense of the opportunities that are out there um, for wineries and the kind of benefits that you can explore in this channel. very complimented to be asked to speak today and I'm uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> I've been in the uh, wine industry for, for quite a few years, but uh, Wine Country Connect was to give you a little bit of history. Um, whoops. Nothing I can't handle. So Wine Country Connect uh, was based actually within days of the Supreme Court ruling in 2005, a, a seminal moment in the wine industry, as we all know. Uh, and, and matter of fact, uh, I uh, sent an email to the head of, uh, of, of after reading a, a Wall Street Journal article about the company to the head of Woot.com uh, the very day that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of, of direct shipping. Um, and then one year to the date, uh, almost exactly, uh, was when uh, we launched uh, the very first offshoot of Woot.com called wine.woot.com. And with that launch, um, we were first to market in uh, the what is now called the flash sale world in, in, in wine. And I think probably more poignantly, we were the first to position the winery uh, as the seller and the website uh, as the advertising portal. And uh, that was a, uh, uh, a very important uh, next stage for us. And uh, so, so really for six years now, uh, we have been, uh, uh, Wine Country Connect has, has quietly and, and virally and efficiently um, helped wineries connect to web audiences through this model. And we've worked uh, with over 300 wineries up to this point. So what does this model bring to the table? What we like to call it, or at least we have up to this point, is called the producer direct marketing model. 
Uh, and when we formulated the idea of, of putting this, um, this model together, we realized the imp importance of simplicity. Um, and that was <clears throat> working with one winery at a time uh, for uh, a finite period of time, and usually with one, one offering at a time, and uh, for a finite period of time. Um, this allowed us to isolate the data, isolate the revenue, uh, and reduce the amount of permutations. And combine that with the inherent benefits of, uh, of the producer direct model, which is the dis disintermediation of the distributor and the retailer, uh, and the increased footprint or delivery footprint that a winery is allowed to do, we really did stumble upon what we believe in at, at the time, and I still believe now, is, is, is really the most logistically optimal way to feature and, and sell wine in the industry today. Um, I think it's logistically beautiful. Um, I really do. Um, couple that with our decision to, as Wine Country Connect, our decision to uh, take on the uh, uh, pick and pack operation. We are a deal specific fulfillment house. We have a Type 14 license. Um, and we've managed uh, to develop a turnkey operation for a winery that really, really avoids the heavy lifting for the, uh, for the winery. Um, and then also inherent in the uh, model that, that we helped establish is that it is winery controlled. And that's a, a very important distinction when you look at different uh, opportunities out there. Make sure that, uh, that you have control over what is put out there, what is discussed, um, and uh, the information that is featured uh, on, on the website and the price. So let's get into a little bit uh, more here. Um, why third-party marketing? Uh, well, in 2012, there are, I mean, there are more labels than ever. It's, it's incredible, uh, the amount of, of labels and uh, brands that are out there, not only in California and the whole country, but also in the, in the, in the world. Uh, and some of the uh, international uh, wineries have marketing agents uh, or marketing campaigns that are driven by the, the country itself. So you need to get your name out there. You really do. Uh, and um, how do wineries and, and Paso Robles and, 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 and off the beaten path here, how do they get their, capture their audience? How do they do it? Um, and with websites like that we work with, um, we isolate and we focus on one winery at a time. Uh, and with um, the features of, for instance, boot.com, uh, we have a nationwide audience that only focuses on that one winery for a, a period of time. Um, <clears throat> we like to connect it to traditional terms. Um, for instance, we, we, we call it the virtual end cap. I mean, really, I mean, if you look at what wineries will do to develop a virtual end cap for a uh, for an in-store opportunity, it's, it's, it's amazing some of the stories I hear about what they'll do to, to, to achieve that. Well, in our, in our instance, we have a virtual end cap uh, that is a nationwide opportunity. Um, and also, when I talk about the online uh, tasting room, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at Woot, it's, uh, it, it really, it, it's amazing in the sense that it has a very robust online community that talks about the deal. Um, and uh, so really, if, if, you, if, if you look at it, there is an opportunity, and we, we actually ask the winery to participate in the daily forums. And so on a daily basis, the winery comes in and engages with the prospective buyers. So you have the ability, not unlike uh, a tasting room, to discuss your wares with those prospective buyers. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and then also, uh, we put the website uh, on all of the... Um, uh, companies that we work with, we put the the website on the site, and we also encourage, um, in an effort to enter, energize your D2C channel, we encourage an insert uh, of a marketing piece into the package, uh, and um, really, it's all about the ability to um, get the glass get uh, get people's uh, wine into your their wine into your, your wine into their glass. Excuse me, sorry about that. Oh, and of course, uh, it, it does give you the ability to sell a significant amount of wine in a short period of time and improves your cash flow. So let's move on. Uh, what, dem what demographic are you not reaching? Well, I can tell you that um, uh, one thing that, that, that is really evident is that there is a new and growing segment of just buyers online, the people that just buy wine online. Uh, and it's a very large and growing entity. 
Um, so essentially, uh, the companies that we work with are dishing up buyers who send, spend thousands of dollars uh, per year on wine. Um, for instance, uh, Rue La La, uh, we uh, are the wine, we, we uh, handle the wine division for Rue La La. Are people familiar with that website? Got that, okay. Um, Rue La La skews women. It's uh, 21 to 60. Um, they're very, very brand conscious. Uh, we call them Henry's, uh, high earnings, not rich yet. Uh, uh, and um, uh, very, very good, very good demographic. Also, um, Woots skew is a male, more 25 to 60, uh, sorry, 25 to 40, 21 to 45, techie, shrewd, uh, inquisitive, and really very loyal. Um, and some, sometimes for life. I've got a great example uh, of uh, Peter Wellington. I don't know if you're familiar with Wellington Vineyards. They have a, he has a smallish uh, winery over in Glen Ellen. Um, he, he told me that there is not a week goes by where he does not get summoned to the tasting room to uh, meet a uh, Woot.com member. So uh, Peter gets uh, visits from Woot.com uh, members on a, literally on a weekly basis. It's become a significant part of his, um, of his marketing efforts. And it's far-reaching. Um, catch up here. It's, it's, it's actually very far-reaching. One of the things that, that Woot.com offers with the ability of the uh, winery to deliver to so many states is it's a nationwide coverage. I mean, you're getting hundreds of thousands of people looking at your wine. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Jeff, excuse me. I took the liberty of um, Jeff uh, Stay works with us on a, a very consistent basis uh, with Twisted Oak. And I took the liberty of, of uh, pulling your data from the mo most recent deal. And uh, you're uh, among the uh, uh, locations where your wine was delivered and sold was Esterville, Iowa, Atoll, Idaho, Hudson, New Hampshire, Germantown, Tennessee, Frisco, Texas, and Monument, Colorado. Uh, all of them very, very much out, uh, off the beaten path wineries. So what an entity like this does for you is, is it permeates into areas where you're in all likelihood uh, not present uh, in a traditional sense. Um, so I think that's an, an, an excellent point. All right. So branding. Um, there are a lot of people, a lot of uh, prognosticators uh, out there that are stating that uh, wine uh, being featured on a third-party marketing entity is, is harmful to your brand. Uh, and I really, I, I really can't speak for other third-party marketing entities, but uh, I've got to tell you, I, I, branding is alive and well in the, in the entities that we work with. Um, for instance, uh, Rue La La, uh, as I mentioned, uh, th there's a wine featured uh, once a week, usually Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, that wine is connected, uh, and uh, items that are sold around it uh, are uh, the, the brands that are associated with the Rue La La offer, thank you, uh, is... Um, very, very top tier brands in the fashion industry, the household industry, the jewelry industry. Amazing brands, uh, Calvin Klein, uh, Ralph Lauren, Puma, Prada. Um, that winery is gonna be associated with those brands and I, I view it as a very, very strong opportunity to lift your brand uh, in that instance. And on the Woot side, I don't know if you had a chance to, to take a look at the, the most recent Woot upgrade, but the photography is fantastic. Um, there is an opportunity to, uh, a, a, with every wine deal, to have a bio, a, a bio or a story uh, that's given uh, by the winery about the brand. And again, each day, uh, the proprietor is, is asked to uh, visit the forums and to uh, engage the audience uh, in, in talking about their story. It's, it's, it's an excellent, excellent opportunity. So branding, 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 very important. Okay. So the other benefit of working with a third-party marketing entity is you get immediate feedback. What sells, what doesn't? You get awesome feedback. For instance, Rue La La, we had a Washington winery on there recently. And who'd have thunk it that Washington wines sell really, really well in Washington? I mean, they really do. It's amazing. Uh, some very interesting data. 
And on the Woot side, you get, uh, within 10 minutes, you get five people discussing whether or not they like the label. You get uh, fans speaking highly about your wines. Uh, a couple of years ago, Marsha uh, Mickelson from Cundy Winery uh, reached out and asked specific questions about what closures uh, people like and dislike. And it helped her make a decision on whether or not to do uh, screw tops for her Sauvignon Blanc. Um, Woot is a painfully honest uh, platform. Uh, another great example is uh, uh, within the first couple hours of one event, um, there were four people that commented that they had a terrible experience on their t in their tasting room. Uh, it was, uh, we were shuddering at the thought, oh no, what's, you know, what's gonna happen? And what happened was that the winemaker got in there, immediately addressed the issue, apologized for what happened, gave, gave his email address, and insisted that when they do come back and try and, and come back, if they do, there will be a, uh, a special tasting just for them. And what happened was that it kind of turned the room. It, it turned the whole forums into a positive. Um, so a lot of uh, very interesting feedback, a lot of very uh, worthwhile information that you, uh, you can get by, uh, by working with a third-party marketing entity like ours. So directly connect to the end users catching up here. Also, we've had probably a half a dozen product launches on, on Woot.com, a couple on Rue La La. Uh, and it really does create a lot of energy um, and get a lot of positive feedback based on, uh, on that new launch. So it's something to consider, for sure. All right. So, challenges. Compliance. I know I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but it really is important uh, being a, a third-party marketer that relies on the delivery capabilities of the winery to maximize your delivery footprint. It really is a, a very important aspect of, uh, we, 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 we check off an assessment before we'll do a deal or not do a deal with what the uh, winery's delivery capability is. And uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, not listen to your controller and you make the decision, for, my, my apologies for controllers out there, but it does seem like the decision to, on whether or not to improve, uh, improve your delivery footprint is not made by the tasting room or by the marketing manager. Um, and I just strongly encourage you to uh, expand that area. I know there are some tough ones, I know Nebraska is a toughie, but uh, highly recommend it. Economics. That's always the biggest question that comes to us. It's the first thing we address when we talk to a winery. Uh, and I can tell you that, uh, uh, you know, I know for a fact that the, at the end of the year they don't go, wow, those third-party marketers, what great margins. I mean, it just it doesn't happen. Uh, I get that. But what I can tell you uh, is that we work directly with the winery uh, and uh, work with them on a plan based on their inventory situation, based on several factors. Uh, oftentimes we'll do a, a, a sample pack of three different wines to help kind of price blind the deal. Um, but yes, typically there's south of FOB is, uh, is what, uh, what that ends up being with uh, the relationships that we have. Um, but I, you know, it, that comes up a lot, the FOB discussion. Hey, can you get me to FOB? And really, uh, the normal factors that, uh, uh, that the FOB calculations take into consideration just aren't present uh, with our, our model. Um, there's no New York, uh, there's no buybacks, there's no travel budget, uh, there's no an entertainment budget, there's no samples to be sent out to 30 states. There's no cost of money for those distributors that are net 120. Um, there is uh, a very simple, a lot less moving parts with what we do. Uh, and I just think it's extremely important to factor in the marketing benefits uh, of working with an entity like ours when you factor in what, what your ultimate take is. Possible channel conflicts, this is, I mean, when we launched in 2006, I mean, it was a lot bigger issue than, than it is now. I mean, initially, there was a significant amount of uh, angst by the distributors and a lot of grumbling. Uh, I know there's still a little bit of grumbling, but that's kind of, that's what distributors do. Um, lately, we have not had much channel conflict at all. It's actually been pretty smooth. There's a lot more of an acceptance, I think, of, uh, of what we, we've done. So recommendations, research. It really is the wild west out there right now. There is a ton of people entering into this market. 
And uh, it's really important that you take a look at who's been out there a long time, check your references, uh, make sure that they're a, an honorable bunch, and uh, uh, you know, do your homework. Definitely do your homework. And then for those of you who haven't, I just I recommend you try it. I mean, just get one under your belt, uh, experience it, get a feel for what it is. Um, I think you'll really be pleased with it, especially uh, especially ours. So overall, um, and thank you uh, for this time, uh, integrate third-party marketing as an essential channel in your wine sales strategy. Uh, make it part of your everyday or your annual assessment. And we're here to stay, and uh, uh, the good ones anyway uh, I, I can be a very, very strong partner for you uh, you know, as, we, as we progress forward in this, this great industry we're in. So, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I'll try to make this a little more smooth on the transition here. <laughs> and we'll have Jeff come up and talk about his experiences working with marketers on the winery side. I'm not going to say anything about compliance. <laughs> they asked me to come in today and just talk about uh, the experience of a winery doing third-party business like this with third-party marketing agents. Uh, we've been kind of um, sluts about it, basically. We try a bunch of different things. We try to see what works, what doesn't, and so forth. So hopefully there's something uh, useful and interesting in here somewhere for you to uh, check out. Uh, really briefly, Twisted Oak Winery, we've been at this about 10 years. We're up in the Sierra Foothills in Calaveras County. Everyone knows where Calaveras County is? Wow. <laughs> See, we have some work to do. We're not, we're not where the N-word is. We're not in Sonoma. We're not on the Central Coast. We're kind of in a place where we've got to make more noise and do something to, to get heard. Um, like many small wineries, the wholesale channel is not as available to us as, as it is for larger wineries. So direct is king. And so what we try to do is our local destination marketing, getting people to come to Calaveras County just to visit so that they will go past our door and perhaps come inside. And uh, working with social media and third party marketers have actually been a big part of getting our name out there. Uh, one of the things they asked me to talk about um, was Facebook. Um, we were one of the first people to get a Facebook store um, on our Facebook page through the, the VIN65 integration. So we actually have a store where people can buy wine on Facebook, check out on Facebook, never leave the comfortable, warm little world of Facebook. Um, I don't really care about that that much. I want the information on Facebook, and I really want the interactions. I want the, the social media ROI for, for what we're doing to be staying connected with people, having them remember Twisted Oak on a, on a daily basis if possible, but we'll take whatever we can get and not worry so much about a direct conversion through a Facebook store. Now that said, what I found was interesting was that when we rolled out the store in the holiday and made a big noise about it, we actually did like 10% of sales uh, for the holidays through the Facebook store itself. Once the holidays went away, that dropped off to zero, but funny thing, we're doing about 10% on referrals. So it's actually kind of working for us. So there you are. But on to the, uh, on to the other stuff. Um, different third party types that I've looked at and in some cases actually done is daily deals um, or even less than daily deals like the Woot type of sale. Um, Multi-day deals, uh, you'd think maybe a daily deal and a, a three-day deal are the same thing, but there's really a different energy to it. When you're dealing with a 24-hour period or even less, people are like on you and they want to know stuff. And there's, there's a huge opportunity for interaction on a three-day deal. It's kind of like, yeah, okay, I'll get around to it. And they eventually buy or whatever. But you don't get that interaction, I think, you get like you do with a daily deal. Um, direct marketing, um, actually getting on the phone and calling people and say, buy wine, is actually a third-party avenue. Uh, we're using one of those companies and actually seeing some good results on sales for that. So that's worked out well. Um, 
I don't think affiliate is really a thing yet. I think they actually clarified some of that last year in the ABC. Affiliate would be basically um, giving somebody a link that they can put on their website, like on Amazon, where you click through and they get a little commission if they click through on that link. Um, I don't know. That's kind of a new thing for wine. But um, referrals, uh, there are websites out there that actually just send you an order. And they keep some fee or something like that. And then finally, the evil coupons. Uh, things that I've learned to watch out for, uh, shipping costs. Uh, some of these folks uh, ship the wine themselves. They've got the fulfillment part of the deal built in. Um, others want you to ship. Others want you to accept what they've decided you should charge for shipping, and you've really got to watch out. Are you going to lose money, big money on the deal because you get a whole bunch of orders to New York and they've only let you charge $5 for shipping. So really understand your shipping deal. Uh, audience, one of the big things I think you get out of this stuff is you get access to a new audience. So when you go to a third party marketer, they've got their constituency and now you get to reach that constituency. Um, I've had third party marketers expect me to market to my own constituency and that doesn't go over well. It really doesn't. So it's something to watch out for. If you think you can do that, that's your choice. It didn't work for me. Uh, how much time does it take? Uh, a daily deal, like I said, if there's a strong interactive aspect to it, like Woot does, for example, you've got a lot to do in that 24 hours, and, and it's really good to stay on top of the discussion. And it's fun, by the way, but it will take your time. Um, longer term sales, maybe not so much. or with some of the other more referral-oriented sites, you're actually setting up a website, and that's really non-trivial. A lot of data entry, a lot of um, copywriting, and that sort of thing. Um, really important, don't anger your wine club. Uh, I've had third-party marketers want me to put something on sale immediately after I've done a wine club shipment on the same wine, and it's like, I can't do that. You know, you just, you've got to watch what your wine club is going to see. They're going to see this. You know, if you've got a good, strong wine club, you've got people in the club that, that are tuned into these deals and you don't want them, you just want to make sure that they feel like they're still getting the deal from your wine club. Um, other hidden consequences were things talked about like the C word um, and, uh, you know, just making sure that that third party marketer knows what they're doing in terms of the legal side. Uh, David talked uh, quite a bit about this stuff, but it's good to say again, your cost of sales. You're not going to make a lot of money on this wine. You're not going to make retail on this wine, but you are going to have a much lower cost of sales. You're not traveling to the destination. You're not paying incentives. You're not uh, booking hotels. You're not paying for meals. It's a much lower cost of the sale, so you can give a little bit on your FOB, and you may move, you know, on the order of pallets of wine and that sort with the right sale that you set up. Um, again, access to customers. Some of the third party sites let you put a link to your website on there. Others actually let you have more contact with the customers or put things into the box or whatever. So, you know, you're getting more benefit out of it. You're doing customer acquisition if that particular third party marketer gives you that access. So that's again, going a loss leader you know, on, on a product where you can afford to lose some more margin on it, you're getting customer acquisition from that. And from some third party sites, I've gotten some of my strongest wine club members and best brand ambassadors. So it really does work. You really can make it happen. Uh, follow on sales, giving them an offer after the offer. Again, that just relates to capturing those customers and making sure that they're now in your fold and that you can continue to have a sales relationship with them directly. And Finally, I think a good third-party site actually is a very great benefit to your brand, particularly if a brand that, that nobody has heard of, like mine, or at least when we started out, it gets the brand name out there, and that can only be a good thing. Good publicity is any publicity. So finally, this is a horrible summary slide because it repeats the previous slide, but um, basically make sure that you're taking into account the real costs and what your benefits are when you price out the deal. Um, factor in your branding, and sometimes you just need to get the stuff out of your warehouse, and that's okay too. That's it. <laughs>
Thanks, Jeff. Uh, let's see. So we have a couple minutes, and I wanted to see, did how many of you guys saw the video about ship compliant marketplace in another session today? Just a few. All right, well, I'd love to show it um, just to give you a sense of where marketplace fits into this whole ensemble. Um, it's a platform for uh, suppliers and marketers to work together, so this should give you a, a good sense. Oh, I thought I knew where it was. We're going to do this from YouTube because I think there were some issues uh, earlier with it. So. Hmm. You know I ran this at least three times right before this. So your direct sales are coming along nicely. Sorry. There we go. Hmm? <laughs> I don't know how to make it better. Let's see. But you want to expand your customer base and attract more repeat sales. Mm -hmm. All these new online markets. This might not be worth it. I'm not sure. Does anyone have a good recommendation? Yeah. Look exciting, but you want to choose the right partner. You have so many questions like, how does it all work? And who is easiest to work with? How and when do I get paid? Can I control the retail price and product placement? And what about credit card processing, contracts, and fees? Most importantly, is this legal and is my license at risk? The questions keep piling up until you get so frustrated that you say, enough, it's not worth the hassle. Well, not so fast. Huh? Introducing Ship Compliant Marketplace. Marketplace is a simple, compliant, and free tool for wineries to help connect them with marketers. We ensure that each marketer establishes a compliant workflow so you can put your brand in front of a galaxy of new customers without the worry. Use Marketplace to learn about and explore new opportunities. See all important details right up front and easily begin new relationships. To help spark the conversation, you can set up a custom profile visible only to marketers. This is your billboard to feature your best sellers and gab about recent awards. When you're ready to begin a sale, simply select a product to offer and include essential details. Share your product with one or more marketers so they can see your product in their own account. Last but not least, allocate inventory, find what you'd like each bottle to sell for and how much you would like to make. They put your product's details on their website, and voila! Orders are checked for compliance against your own license and charge sales tax according to your set preferences. Plus, you can approve or reject each order request in your account or in your daily email. When the order ships, we safely and securely capture and disperse funds on your behalf, so you get paid with all the control and none of the hassle. Marketplace sales data seamlessly integrates into your existing ship compliant account for easy reporting and no process adjustments. Start using Marketplace today to easily work with online wine marketers. Before you know it, you'll have tons of new repeat customers begging for more. Ship Compliant Marketplace, compliantly connecting wine supply with demand. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, hopefully that gave you um, a sense of where Ship Compliant Marketplace fits in. Um, we obviously believe strongly that this channel is really an opportunity for wineries to not only gain new customers, but learn new things about the channels that they're operating in. So I want to just quickly say how to get started. I think that's probably the, the next thing you're wondering. Um, this page right here can be accessed from our website, from shipcompliant.com slash marketplace. This is intended for um, wineries who are not ship compliant customers, 
um, at this time. So this is a way to sign up for a free account. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but I'll also show you uh, how to quickly get started with your account, um, where you'd find that in a ship compliant account. So this is a uh, winery account within ship compliant, and this is the marketplace landing page. And you can see this is a new, a new account, new to marketplace. Um, they don't have um, stats in here yet, but the thing to notice here is that um, the first step in working with marketplace is to learn more about the marketers, and that's you know a lot of what we emphasized today was making sure you're doing your research. So you can see there was a list there of about seven marketers um, that are under available connections. Sorry about the page. Um, and these are marketers who are not only integrated with um, the API, but they also are certified by our technology team to make sure that the, both the consumer process and the behind the scenes process are compliant with all the issues that we've talked about today. So it's a good way to learn about them um, and connect with them um, to get started uh, on these programs. So should we turn it over to Q&A? Any questions for anyone in particular? Yes? Uh, so the winery that are in our ship plan now, is there a cost for the winery? Is there a what? A cost for the winery? No, there's not a cost for them to kind of set up an account, get to know marketers, and, and get products in the, into the system and, and out to others. Mm -mm. Anyone else? Yeah. How do you reconcile the different state laws? I know in New York recently, the ABC chastised people who were selling under the Wall Street Journal brand or the Gap brand and mm -hmm. taking the credit card. You know, California wineries can hold their license on the line. You know, those are big national brands that are all doing it. How do you, how do you know where to extend yourself? Yeah. Does anyone have an initial response? or? to information like that that's happening in the marketplace um, and you work with people that are able to answer your complicated questions about what is going to make you comfortable in New York. Um, I, you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't make you that comfortable about what's happening in New York right now. I mean, I can make you very comfortable about what's happening in California. Use the ship compliant platform and you're fine in California, right? And it's uh, the commissioners in New York and the chairman of the SLA are really struggling with the issue because of this availing idea that they've got. And they just haven't decided yet exactly where they're going to come down. Um, I can say in New York, you're very safe if you are paying 10% or less to a marketer. Um, and the state tends to look at it as 10% or less of your overall profits from your winery, as opposed to 10% or less of the transactions. So where you should be concerned in New York as you consider opportunities right now, I think, is if you are just doing a massive amount of sales through a singular channel in the state. I think that's where the state's going to come down is next. Is it okay for them to take a credit card and pass the ownership to this one? New York is still struggling with that issue. They recognize that people pay credit cards to buy at retail. Um, it is understood by the state that payment processing is okay and is not a sale of alcohol and that there are separate businesses completely designed to do nothing other than process payment. So it's an issue that they're struggling with. Just to add to that, some of the issue is cash flow. And as a third party marketer, and I'm happy to be one of the only third party marketer up there, you know, we, there's a lot of money that's, there's a lot of capital that's spent on driving ad revenue, media buys to actually drive the, you know, the audience to come and purchase that specific wine. So there's cash flow that's a lot involved. So a lot of times uh, companies that are third party marketers outside of the ship compliant uh, are looking to create that credit card to have the cash flow to play for that media. So that's part of the issue that you're dealing with as well. No, no question the morality of it. I'm just saying that if there's somebody who has a problem with them being the first taker of the currency and passing it down the channel, and if the, the, the producer put his license at risk, if he's the one who I think it's a gray area, correct? I think there's also um, a couple of different ways to have that payment process just because you know, one entity might be actually running the credit card or entering the credit card information, 
Um, it doesn't mean that the funds are necessarily depositing um, in the account owned by that entity and they wouldn't necessarily have the ability to extract funds from it. So, so there are ways to separate um, where those funds land from who actually processed the credit card itself um, to make it more compliant. State, state ABCs don't understand financial instruments very well, and they don't understand payment processing very well, and that's why they're struggling with it. State ID, AB, ABCs like the idea of control. They like the idea of the licensee being transparent and that somewhere there's someone they have jurisdiction over who is lawfully making a shipment into the state and that in some way that person is controlling the funds. There's lots of financial instruments and back of the house things that can still get you to that point, even if the credit card says the name of the third party marketer on somebody's credit card bill. That doesn't mean that those funds you know, are settling to the third party marketer's account as opposed to the winery. So it's unsettled, it's gray, and there are at this point 50 different ways to construct the back end to put yourself in a good and defensible position as states like New York explore the issue. going to have an offering, uh, what is the largest amount of cases that you've moved on an offering and what is the smallest amount? Yeah, thanks. Um, just in the last three months, I'll just give that span of data. Um, we, um, was about as low as we've gone, at, you know, I would say is, in, 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 and I speak in terms of packs, I'm a logistics guy, so I think of three packs, four packs, and it depends on what day it is, what pack size it's going to be, but, you know, we've done as low as uh, 153 packs in a, in a day, and recently we did a, a, an offer with Pedrincelli Winery where we did a case and we sold uh, approximately 2,200 cases in one day. Yeah. This question is also for you, David. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that a lot of these, uh, a, a lot of your audience actually is, uh, you, you put it as loyal. Mm -hmm. um, how are you measuring this loyalty? Repeat buys. Repeat. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the Wine.Wood crowd will, um, you know, there's always about you know, usually 10 to 15% new and almost you know, all the rest is repeat. Um, and then also <clears throat> there's a, a ton of anecdotal evidence that for wineries who get it and who it really do engage with the audience that they get loyal, loyal partners. Um, I mentioned the Peter Wellington. I think we were among your uh, comments that, um, you know, there, there, there really is a, uh, using that forum and the, and the wineries who do it better than the winer wineries that don't get that loyalty. So it's an opportunity for the winery to excel, uh, and, and but those who don't, they they don't get the loyalty. Yep. What does it mean to do it better? What what are the things that those wineries are doing that yeah. enhance their success? Boy, I mean, I tell you, the guy to my left can answer that question better than I could. He's fantastic. Um, everybody knows El Jefe on the wood on the wood boards. I can tell you that. Um, you know, first of all, active engagement. Um, it launches, the Woot.com program launches it at midnight central Texas time. You know, and the good ones get on there and go, hey, happy to be here. Happy to answer any questions. You know, thanks very much for, for jumping on the boards. What, what's, the, what's the pH on this wine, you know, and, they, and what's your cooperage on this wine? Well, they engage and ask questions and answer, answer questions. And they're real. Um, you know, we've had a couple of wineries that wax eloquent about, you know, this wine tastes like the sitting on a deck and, you know, on the beach. And they're like, what? You know, forget it. Get out of here. But if you're real, if you're candid, if you're passionate about what you do, um, that really comes out in the, in the Woot forums. So it's very impressive. And there's one thing that you, you, you got to make sure you don't do. Uh, and this has happened where um, a winery will tell their friends to jump on the boards and it's, and espouse the, the, the value of their wines. Well, there's ways for the Wooters to know when you signed up, how many comments you've had beforehand, and whether or not you, uh, you've purchased. And uh, there's been a couple times where they go, they, they're, they're shills, and they, they call them on it. And it, it's amazing how sales will just stop when they know somebody's trying to pull a fast one. 
the Wood audience can smell a rat from, from 100 miles away. They really can. The number one question, by the way, is does this wine age? Be ready for that one. <laughs> but I would, I'd also recommend that you just check it out and, and, and get on it and, and view it. Be a lurker for a couple months or a couple days. Yeah. Actually, that goes for any site. If you're thinking about doing something on it, be a customer. Get on there and see what they've got, see how they treat you. It's a great measure of how that site's going to work for you. Hi. Is this on? Uh, this message is for David. You mentioned your uh, Woot and Rua La demographic. Uh, how, much, how many email or subscribers do you have on each of those ad, uh, marketing avenues? And what's your daily visit as well as your conversion rate? I think I heard that. Um, it's funny, uh, up until about a year ago, Woot did not send out emails. Uh, I thought that was amazing. Uh, they, uh, they just generated interest without bombarding people with emails, but they do send one email a day currently. And I don't have specifics, but I think I can speak in generalities, and this is more my opinion than, than actual uh, facts, but uh, the Woot.com parent site in which the wine is, is viewed from uh, or the wine.woot segment is viewed from gets uh, on or about a million hits a day. Uh, and the wine.woot site where people pursue and pursue and go to the wine.woot site is in the range of 250 to 300,000 hits per week. Um, I know that uh, Rula La has a membership that is between four and five million. I hope that answers your question. Daily visits and conversion. Ah. Uh, I don't know that answer. I really don't know specifics on that. But yeah, hopefully you can glean from that. Anybody else? Okay. Are you asking a question? No. Just holding the mic. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, you are? <laughs> <laughs> Crashing. <laughs> All right, well, 